Hi. So back again at recombination and generation, but now at interfaces. So we'll look at uh, something that's really relevant to real devices and something that constituted a big uh, um, breakthrough and without which I wouldn't be presenting here in this kind of form. So a MOSFET, believe it or not, was actually patented in the 1930s in Germany without having a physical device at hand. And it couldn't be implemented due to something called interface states. The original bipolar junction transistor had issues with surface states. It was never put into production in this original form. So there was a very significant issue that dealt with interface states. Um, here is a sketch from a uh, publication in 1961 from a, a planar trans uh, that aims towards a, a, a planar transistor. What was done at the time was you had uh, bipolar junction transistors, we'll talk about that more extensively in this course, where electrons flow from the emitter to the collector through multiple layers or, or doping levels of material controlled by the base. The base is controlling the overall flow. That is the gate in the bipolar tr uh, transistor. What was happening though is that there's other flow from the base into the collector through some leakage path. And that was due to defects, surface defects, surface states. And that was a detrimental effect to the overall device performance. The innovation was to cover all of this in silicon dioxide and close it and make planar transistors. And that was a major breakthrough in the mass production of transistors in the 1960s. So overcoming interface issues has actually become really important for these semiconductor devices. All right. So let's look at some of these uh, uh, structures again. This is a plot uh, we had shown in the past. So. Let's look at the atomic configuration of these bulk states first. So we had looked at beautiful crystal uh, structures. We worked on all kinds of um, uh, crystal symmetries and, and Brion zone, etc. And we derived um, band structure um, calculations where we came up with band structure, band gap, conduction bands, valence bands. But now let's focus a little bit here on the surface of the semiconductor with some other material, in this case with silicon dioxide. So let's open the system a little bit like this. And what happens if you uh, uh, do not do anything particular to the uh, uh, surface of a semiconductor, you will have these uh, bonds that are not quite satisfied. You have single dangling bonds in a structure like this. Now. You might have electrons that still flow through the system, but eventually you'll also find an electron that likes to satisfy this bond. It'll bind to this dangling bond and um, will no longer be a free electron unless until some other force drives it away. Now, this uh, trapping and detrapping at interface changes the electrostatics of the device. And that means, say, the turn on and turn off uh, characteristics of this device will fluctuate, which will be a bad thing as it's temporally uh, dependent. So that needs to be overcome by some shape or form, and that is what the major innovation uh, was in the 1960s that at Fairchild enabled uh, in the planar process to passivate these kind of bonds. All right, so now let's put this back together just for a few minutes and consider this in maybe a more pictorial uh, view. All right, so in the past we calculated uh, bulk states and in infinite periodic potential assuming the world had no end, right? So we might have had considered an, an, uh, a crystal like this and we drew this periodic potential, we even drew some wave functions and there was a, a derivation of an EK diagram, which then allows us to consider band edges, and we drew, begin to draw devices like this, where there's a spatial dependent band edge. But there was no consideration 
of a, an open surface. So we never even talked about what could happen at a surface, right? So if you have a surface like this with dangling bonds, what you do introduce are some uh, bound states or dangling states at the edge. And they typically form throughout the, the band gap. So pick any spot, there, there will be a surface state, say, uh, at the position here of the blue line. Now, these, there won't be just one state. I mean, you will have, oh, so, let me back up. So here, um, this uh, state at the surface can now serve as a recombination center, just like a trap. So an electron can hop down and uh, destroy a hole, or a hole can hop up into the trap and then recombine with an electron. But this state is now sitting at a surface. It's not just sitting somewhere in bulk, but it sits at a particular surface. Now, you will have not perfect uh, flat interfaces. There will be 3D shape, 2D shapes, uh, different configuration of these bonds. So that you will have lots of these kind of traps that are sitting in the in the gap, okay? So, and, and the details of which are determined by the details of these interfaces. So, you might have another trap state like this, where an electron can hop down and uh, all the way down. But the point is of this plot here that you have lots of these kind of surface states. In fact, you almost have a continuum like states because there is. Um, at an open surface, you have number of atoms at the surface with dangling bonds. We calculated the number of atoms on surfaces and specific surfaces. Remember when we did the crystal section, you counted electrons in certain cut directions, etc. That is why this is relevant. You can count the number of states that are available at the surface and the number of dangling bonds that are available. And if you do calculations like this in an atomistic basis, like my research group does with the NEMO software, we can literally calculate the eigenvalues at those surfaces. And these surfaces are full of states, and they typically have eigenvalues that are right throughout the gap. Okay, lots of states available. But one thing you have to mind, remember in the calculation that goes forward, what can happen here is one electron can hop down to one state and then go down all the way, but it cannot hop through multiple surface states. So it's a single hop road down to the conduction mat. So that is due that these states are actually localized. They are localized throughout uh, uh, the crystal edge, the surface, and an electron will not reduce its energy by hopping madly to the lowest point. So they're not going to hop down in a cascade through these states because these states are delocalized from each other. So it's always a one-hop run. And that will be helpful in the calculation that we'll do later in terms of computing an overall relaxation with such surface states. Okay. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the surface states. Now we're going to begin calculating the um, Shockley-Reed-Hall expressions for such surface states in the next section. So I'll see you there.